want to introduce uh, Leigh uh, Middleton. She's the CEO of the National uh, Youth Agency. Leigh, do we do we have you on the line, as it as it were? I feel like Noel Edmonds at the moment. Hi, Rory. Yes, you do. Hello. How are you? Maybe, maybe I maybe I should I should grow a wee goatee. I'm not. I might not get this gig again. Um, look, I just want to say you're the CEO of the National Youth Agency in England, and uh, you're going to tell us a bit more about like, the statutory guidance that's coming there. I'm really interested to hear what lessons we can learn, and uh, the the floor is yours. So, so do take it away. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll um just share my screen. Can you see that? We certainly can. Colleagues are nodding. That's good to know. Great. Hi. Right, so, um, yes, um, Lee Middleton from the National Youth Agency for here in England. Um, I've been asked to give you a bit of an overview of uh, some of the developmental work that's been going on across England, some of which we've been playing the long game uh, and, and some things are in build up for the next election, uh, which obviously is not that far away. So um, for those not familiar with the National Youth Agency, we are the professional statutory regulatory body for youth work here in England. Um, I guess ultimately our job is to make great youth work happen in all its places and spaces across the country. Um, and we do that through setting qualification standards, providing guidance uh, and other sorts of standards around practice, safeguarding, uh, involvement of young people, uh, youth rights, uh, EDI, all sorts of things we are involved in. Um, so, yes, we are the sort of national body uh, across the country for England that's trying to strengthen youth work. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of YouthWorks journey. I put a little picture of a jigsaw in the top corner there because I think what what we've been trying to do over the last few years is to rebuild um, the jigsaw of, of youth work across England. Anyone who's followed England closely will be fairly familiar with the devastating cuts that have certainly taken place through the coalition government years and and are still felt very large today. Um, I just thought. I'd steal this from the YMCA England and Wales and, and and they've done some work around the spend on youth work in England and you can see there we went from nearly 1.3 you know, 1 and a half billion uh, down to nearly 400 uh, million by 2018-19 that number went down a bit further it's slightly ticked up in the last in the last year we believe but um, it is still a you know a billion pounds less spent uh, in real terms on youth work across England which is uh, had a massive impact um, just to give you a flavour of that impact, um, some recent research that we've been involved in uh, around London, just looking at the impact of uh, the cuts in, of, into youth work around the youth justice spaces, uh, showed that you know the closure of youth provision in London led to a 10% increase in crime. There is a direct researchable correlation between the two. Um, and and you know what we also realised uh, through that research uh, done by a PhD student, so it's got got all the credit it needs. Um, the youth the youth work spend that we are making is saving five hundred million pounds per year of the public purse, uh, you know, on policing, crime, health, uh, schools and education, social care, all those areas. So, uh, you know, although we've, you know, what I would say for every you know we we would say for every pound you put into youth work you get seven to 14 pounds back and uh, there's a lot there's more and more studies coming out in, in, in the new year that sort of back that up i understand so um it's good it's good maths to spend uh it's good it's it spend money on youth work and uh, i think we've started to try and get um the government here in england to sort of recognize that um i i said some of our work has been a, a long burner and and never more than the APPG. Um, so the all party parliamentary group is what APPG stands for. And this is a group of 60 or so MPs that uh, we assembled in uh, far, four or five years ago now to um, undertake an, in an inquiry into the role on, and health of youth work across England. Um, we had over a, over 100 uh, submissions of evidence. We had multiple hearings. We had uh, MPs sitting, as you would see, like a select committee, uh, hearing witnesses from young people, from practitioners, from funders. And, and ultimately, what the MPs concluded was that um, there needed to be a radical rethink around youth work across England. There needed to be new investment in, in youth work in England. We needed to rebuild our youth work qualifications and our infrastructure. Uh, and we needed to invest in uh, you know, frontline practice. One of the areas that was also highlighted by the MPs through that inquiry was that the, um, youth work is technically a statutory responsibility of what we call tier one local authority, so sort of county councils um, or unitaries or metro metro mayor areas. Um, it is technically a statutory a statutory duty of those councils, but is often largely ignored. Um, and that's because the guidelines the government publishes to local authorities uh, be, it was was pretty wishy washy to be very polite about it. So essentially, the the legislation in the act says you know they mu you must do these things, uh, a number of things, and then the guidance is the government's document to local authorities and says how they must apply it. And that guidance was very very watered down. 
in 2012. Uh, it became a three-page bag of nonsense, frankly, that just sort of allowed so many local authorities to simply ignore um, their responsibilities. And I say responsibilities because the the Education Act that sets out the legislation uh, actually enshrined this because of children, young people's rights under the uh, UN Convention. So, you know, picking up the theme of today's event around the rights of young people, there is a right to youth work in England, and and we finally convinced the government to review it. So, ministers four four and a half years ago agreed to revisit the duty guidance. Um, uh, they started work on it. Uh, it went through uh, well, the pandemic, basically paused it for nearly two and a half years. And the NY has to do an awful lot of work with partners and stakeholders and young people to get it moving again. But I'm very and, and, and I'm, but I'm pleased to say that um, yeah, in September of this year, the government published this white document that you can see on the screen here, which is the new statutory guidance for local authorities in England. Um, this is quite a game changer for us down here, because without this level of statutory underpinning, the pressures on our local authority services from social care, special needs, asylum seekers and many other areas is so great that unless there's a very clear national statement from the government that says you must you must invest in these things, you must do these things, um, we're going to continue to see we were going to continue to see youth work slipping backwards. Um, just to put this into policy context, um, the government here uh, in 2022 published uh, it's what it calls its national guarantee. Um, and the green box is the one to focus on on this slide. This is just a, a screenshot of the press release. But the screen, we want every young person, no matter where they're from, to get the best start in life with supporting them through a national youth guarantee with regular access to clubs, activities and adventures away from home and volunteering opportunities. And what they mean by this and what they've subsequently expanded on is that all young people should have access to weekly youth work, youth work provision. Now that could be youth work through uniformed youth groups, it can be through traditional local authority projects, through the voluntary sector, it could even be through the commercial sector, although there's very little of that. Um, so the government made a real clear, clear statement that young people have a have this right to youth provision and will uh, and they've put they you know they put 560 million pounds behind this now most of that 560 million pounds has gone into a capital program to rebuild youth centers um and to modernize the youth estate um in the 60s and 70s we built three and a half thousand youth centers across england they're all falling apart so this was funding to help kind of revitalize that there's money here for national citizenship service for the uniformed youth sector duke of edinburgh and and, and significant investment uh, compared to previous years in workforce uh, around the sort of professional workforce for youth work um so we now have this new statutory duty guidelines the duty hasn't changed i think that's very clear very important to recognize the same duty they've had since 1996 there's a statute duty for youth work going all the way back to the First World War, so or post First World War. So um, this isn't necessarily new, but it, it is kind of reinforcing the duty of local authorities to uh, secure sufficient provision. And that I will go through that. The NYA took was been uh, was asked by the government to act as uh, strategic advisors to the government on 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 the crafting of this document, alongside the local government association for councils here in England, uh, Cosler, Cosler, I think you have up in in Scotland the equivalent of and between the lj and the nya we we sort of scrutinized the government's work around this um, and i'll just to explain that we had to get quite detailed in this process uh down to lawyers on behalf of the nya uh were commissioned to undertake a, a public law review of the legislation to understand the extent of which the the guidelines should stretch um because if they stretch too far then local authorities could choose to ignore it because it's beyond the legislation if it doesn't stretch far enough, then the government isn't going far enough in terms of meeting its its rights, its responsibilities to young people's rights. Um, and I, I'm really pleased. I think we found a, a really good balance middle ground here. Um, this guidance, the white document I'm referring to here, it's not perfect and, and it's not got everything the NYA would like to see. But that's because the legislation itself isn't perfect. And, and there's certainly, you know, it was in 96, so it's a bit old now. But it does the job. It does a good enough job for now. Um, and and our, a part of our manifesto requests going forward would be to have further legislation strengthened around youth work and um what ministers have told me is that they want to see how this this guidance lands how the world responds to it um and if there isn't the response that everybody hopes and expects well then then the, the door will be open for new legislation which is which i suspect will end up there to be honest but i hope let's hope we don't but what we did as the as the as national body for youth work was to create the document on the uh, you can see on the side here the left how to fulfill your statute duty um in england about a third of councils have no youth service no youth provision no grants program a third have a small grants program of some description maybe a small amounts of small commissioning 
you know, we're talking under tens of thousands, uh, maybe a few hundred thousands. Um, and then about a third of councils have a youth service of sorts, but they're all very different today in that uh, most of them are very targeted youth provision. Uh, and, and and yeah, they're, they're all you know, often blended with family services, children's services. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it does need to be a distinct offer for young people. So we created the toolkit here, which was a real kind of um, ladybird book guide, if you wish, to how to set up and run uh, a, a youth offer in in your lo in their local areas, and it's it's the legislation and our guide breaks down to these nine core section, section, sections, and I'm just going to walk you through them. So fundamentally, the whole of the duty rests on local authorities understanding what are the needs of young people in their local area. Um, Councils sitting on vast amounts of data around school attendance, social care, health, well-being, police and crime, all sorts of things, but actually most of the time that data is not is is mapped across the what well, i will call the working day so or schools you know when children are in schools um and actually the legislation that the education act uh, enshrined is leisure time provision so this is support for young people to improve their well-being outside of school in their leisure time and in it, young people spend 85 percent of their waking hours outside of their schools so between hol school holidays evenings weekends 85 percent of their waking hours are not in school <laughs> And so this guidance is very clear. It's about providing the right support for young people to transition from childhood to adulthood successfully um, by being supported beyond the school gates. Um, it's for the legislation is is very clear. It's for provision for 13 to 19 year olds. And just to give you a flavor, in England, there's lots and lots of amazing voluntary youth sector activity, but the vast majority of it is under 13. Um, a lot of it is groups of parents borrowing a village hall, running a uh, running a, a more leisure fun uh, form of sort of youth club. Um, it's not what we would call professional youth work. It's brilliant activity. We really welcome it. We want to nurture it and support it. We want it to be safe and and safe and secure, but. Um, fundamentally, it is not providing, you know, the voluntary youth sector doesn't provide the sufficiency of provision for 13 to 19 year olds or up to 25 with SEND. Now, there are some amazing, of course, there are dozens and dozens, hundreds of amazing youth work projects across the country that do might meet that need. Um, and, and that forms part of the local offer. So anyway, local authorities are taking a detailed needs analysis of the needs of young people out of school in their leisure time. Um, and, and anyone who's keeping watch on school attendance data, um, you know, 5% of children are, are, are totally absent from secondary school um, currently post pandemic and up to 20, 20 odd percent, 22% are consistently what we call persistently absent from school. That means they're, they're missing school at least one day a fortnight. So these children aren't in these young people aren't in school to access school based provision hence the really importance on community based leisure time support and um, the law is also very clear that there's a legal responsibility to involve and engage young people in the process so young people have a right to be involved in the co-design the, the they have their view they have their voices heard within that needs analysis within the plan of developing that local offer um and so and it has to be very specific, I think, around engaging young people in their leisure time interests rather than their, you know, how good is your school or how good is your well-being. It's, it is focused on those on those elements of, of, of how the legislation focuses. Um, the other element of the legislation is very clear is the voluntary youth sector has a legal right to be involved as well. So councils can't sit there on their own deciding what they want to do to fit their own agenda or to fit, you know, to reduce their social care priorities. I mean, they can do that. That's absolutely fine. But they, they have to do that alongside the voluntary sector who have a right to feed in their intelligence, their ideas. They're on the ground doing the work um, often. And so it's only right and proper that they have a, a real voice within the room. So across those three things at the top there, young, you know, young people, the voluntary sector, and probably practitioners, their parents, et cetera, have a role to be involved in developing a decent, a detailed needs analysis. And then from that needs analysis, developing uh, a local youth offer, the, the box in the middle here. And ultimately the duty is on every local authority to secure a sufficient offer to meet the needs of young people in their leisure time. Now, what? just to be really clear, that isn't a duty to actually deliver that provision. So actually, if there's so much voluntary youth sector activity and it's all to a lovely high standard with trained staff and it's all evaluated brilliantly, then that off, then that duty is probably met by by the local ecosystem, the local voluntary youth sector. Um, invariably, that's not the case anywhere in the country. So invariably, there are gaps, there are pockets of communities, there are housing estates, there are you know towns and villages with no youth provision at all, and the needs analysis would find that, would map that out. And go actually in in locations A, B, and C. We 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 don't have youth provision to support young people. We need to we need to uh, take steps to provide that.
And that may mean the local authority having to fund it. It may mean having to work with existing providers to grow provision. And um, as NYA, we don't really mind. It's just about making sure that every young person who needs it and deserves it has access to appropriately trained, trusted adults with youth work qualifications and, and skills to support their development. And all of that has to go into a local youth offer plan. And the local authority has to publish that plan and publish that needs assessment in an obvious place. They also have to publish the local youth offer. The law says that you know, young people have to be able to find the provision, find the support. It's no good just having a project and no one knowing it exists. So the local authorities also got to involve young people in how they promote it and develop that. Once you've got that offer and we know what it is um, and what, what we expect and what we are seeing is, um, say, typically a local authority might have 50 percent of the need met and 50 percent still to go. This Don't, don't quote this 50 percent. This is just for sort of demonstration purposes. So 50 percent. There are projects in areas and they're meeting about half the need. There are other communities and communities can be. Uh, geographical, they could be thematic, so it could be the LGBT, LGBT community, it could be young carers community, you name it, um, and, and SEND is the other one that's coming up a lot at the moment, and, and they have to then develop that local offer and in their plan publish how they plan to get from where they are today to where they need to be to meet the need. And I think they have a sort of what's been indicated is there's a medium term financial plan window, which is around three years for most local authorities. So a three year window to get from where they are to where they what we need to be um, in, in what I recognise is incredibly difficult financial circumstances for local authorities. Certainly in England, they are many starting to call it what we call 114, which is uh, you can't technically go bankrupt, but it's similar. Um, and so under incredible difficult financial circumstances, the local authorities got to work out how it's going to get from uh, where its starting point is, which won't be zero, but up to where it needs to be to meet the need. It has a need to develop the local workforce because you've got to provide the skills, the training to support those trusted adults. Um, and, and we are starting to see a bit of resurgence around what youth work planning around workforce and training. Uh, we've got brand new apprenticeships in youth work, which are starting to make a big difference. All of that youth offer should be underpinned by the National Youth Work Curriculum, which I shall come on to in a second. Um, there has already been a legal duty on every local authority to safeguard young people. So developing training, support, monitoring of, of provision to ensure that it is safe and sound and secure. Mm -hmm. And also that those those providers and their volunteers or their staff know how to navigate the safeguarding system within their area, which are always constantly under shifting and changing as they're improved. So, uh, you know, there's a duty to make sure there's a partnership really between the local authority and and providers around that. And then finally, um, the, the, the duty guidance from the government sort of says, well, you need to monitor and evaluate this. It's fine to have a plan to publish it, but is it making the difference you expect it to do? Are there new pockets of need popping up that now need responding to? Are there areas that you could de you could deprioritize because they no longer needed? Um, and there are a couple of areas that I think I just wanted to highlight within all of this, which is there's two legal phrases that everyone gets quite hung up about. One is around reasonably su well sufficient. It has to be sufficient provision that everyone gets panicky about. But actually, what we, that's been fairly well clarified now in our document in particular which is um, it's making sure that when you've done that needs analysis, there is sufficient provision. And the best example I can give you is there's a, a, count, a coastal, uh, large coastal town um, that, that spoke to us recently and said, we've got lots of girls, girl guides and scout groups. We've got lots of sports clubs and activities um, that that duty is met. We don't need to invest in youth work. And when we looked at it very carefully, and, I'm, and I'll pick on the scouts and girl guides who do amazing work and who are brilliant at what they do in their, in their local area. Um, the vast, vast majority of scout and girl guiding provision is is under 13s. I mean, it's, it's a few percentage of total young people involved in scouts and girl guides are over over 13. Um, and so actually that duty isn't met by having lots of scouts and girl guides as much as brilliant as those colleagues are and the work that they do is, is wonderful. And so actually what we had to say to the authority was you need to demonstrate how you're meeting the needs of a 13 to 19 year old, not a, not under 13. We also looked at the data for their voluntary youth sector. And as I said earlier, a lot of that provision is, is more junior work, if you wish, still has great value, still phenomenal. We love it, but it doesn't meet the duty under the legislation. So local authorities have got to understand, I've got to map all that. They've got to understand it and they've got to be, they've got to publish it. The other area is, um, what's called reasonably practicable, a uh, horrible legal phrase, um, but most people are familiar with it from the Health and Safety Act, where it's, you know, in the Health Safety Act, you must take steps to prevent harm, uh, well, reasonably practical steps, I should say, to prevent harm. And the same legislation, the same legal phrase applies here. You must take reasonable steps to meet that duty. Um, it's perfectly reasonable to accept that you can't meet the you can't meet the, the needs of every young person everywhere all the time. Um, but you have to 
have made a real fist of it and demonstrated how your plan meets those needs. Well, the other thing with the Health and Safety Act and the Equality Act too, if 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 you can't prevent, you have to mitigate. So um, the challenge that's been laid down is if you can't provide provision because it's they're in the middle of the Yorkshire Dales and there's only three young people on the top of a hill and it's just not practical. Well, what is your mitigation for those young people? How can they provide? How are you providing support digitally? telephone services web services other other means to meet the needs of those young people so it's not good enough to go oh it's too hard we're not going to do it it's not good enough to say we haven't got any money we're not going to do it um and we were hearing that a lot a couple of years ago there's no money it's not nothing's reasonably practical because we haven't got any cash we're, we're out um that doesn't wash anymore and the guidelines are very clear the the, the duty the council have so these are nine steps and nine areas that every, not what we call the nine essentials that every local authority is now uh, pouring over and, and developing their plans on um just a few things to build on all that work. Um, what, what the guidelines document, the um, blue document here, the how to fulfill your duty. Uh, this is a literally has checklists in it. It has uh, links to lots of tools and resources. And uh, what we've done at the NYA over the last um, year is to rewrite and develop all of our assets, all our guidance to match the national, the new statutory duty. So we have published guidelines around safeguarding in the youth sector. There is new national practice standards, what good practice looks like. Um, we've developed a, what we call Youth Club in a Box, which is literally a handbook in how to set up a, a, a modern youth provision project. Um, and we've even had to go as far as uh, guidelines around private dwellings. We discovered through the pandemic there was an awful lot of provision taking place in in. Well, I can only say unsafely in workers' homes, um, and uh, we've we've sort of outlawed this. It's it's completely unacceptable. So um, we've published a whole suite of new guidelines alongside quality mark and quality standards, uh, youth voice standards through our Here by Right program, building on the Lundy model, uh, and lots of other things that come from other organisations. So there's a national outcomes framework from George Williams College. Um, UK Youth have done some work as well, which uh, are around data and analysis, analysis. So lots of things sort of pulling in. Um, and we put it all in one place to help every local authority navigate it. So there's a whole suite now of professional standards to raise the game and raise the bar for youth work in England. Um, we've also modernised the youth work qualifications here. Um, and so we do this every every few years and we work with CLD up in Scotland. Uh, we have the joint uh, process where we work across across nations, obviously with Wales and Northern Ireland as well. Uh, but we've got in England, we now have brand new uh, apprenticeships at level three and a brand new degree apprenticeship. The degree apprenticeship in particular is changing the game uh this this is a, we have the apprenticeship levy in england which is a fund that every employer um who has a payroll bill of over five million pounds a year has to pay into uh they pay about half of half one half of one percent of their payroll bill a year into it and there are billions of pounds sitting in unspent apprenticeship levy pots and and in businesses can gift their apprenticeship levy. So if they can't spend it internally, they can gift up to 25% to their voluntary sector to another company. Um, so what we've been able to do is set up a, a matching pro service where we are now, um, and the best example I can give you is we're, we're very proud of is NatWest or RBS um, is, is gifting us uh, several millions of pounds of their apprenticeship levy funding, which we are distributing to frontline voluntary projects to get their youth workers trained up. Local authorities who have to pay into this levy funding are able to use their levy money now to get their workers at level three or level six trained so we're starting to see a lot more um movement around the training space it's it's going to take a little bit longer you're not going to see massive lifts in the numbers probably for the next 18 months but after that i would expect to see quite a shift so with the duty we've remodernized all the youth work qualifications uh and all the basic training we also have a national academy at the nya which is provides free cpd training on uh 40 odd topics to keep our sector uh kind of on top of things and up to speed and most of that is free which is we're very proud of we have the National Youth Work Curriculum, which is the core framework now that underpins all youth work across England. And the, the thing to focus on here is the ring, the big, the, the, the ring of 10 themes. Uh, and these are the thematical areas in which youth work makes a difference. So if we're trying to address serious youth violence, well, serious youth violence often is, is focused on young people's identity and belonging, if they're you know identifying with gangs or other communities, uh, health and well-being, because you know, getting stabbed in and in, in what have you is 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 not good for your health and, and your mental health, etc. But actually economic well-being, um, youth provision should be creative and fun. All youth work, you know, is about building health and safe relationships. So we're doing a lot of work around that. So we're asking the youth sector and we're working with the youth sector in England to articulate the impact it's making on young people against these 10 themes. And it's uh, it's, it's 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 going great guns. I'm very proud. Um, we've also launched as part of this new effort, uh, a national register of youth workers, which very much mirrors uh, the work that uh, CLD have got in Scotland around the national register you have. 
So we now have a, a register that all practitioners, all G professional Jane, what we call Jane C level six, level seven practitioners sign up to. Uh, and, and we're now registering youth workers and we will move in the next few years to register all work, all the whole workforce across England. Um, there's about 100,000 people. So it's going to quite take quite a job and, and probably more budget than we've got at the moment. But we are we are building back, if you wish, the parity of respect and esteem between youth work, teachers and social workers. That was disconnected uh, over the last decade. And working with the government and stakeholders, we are reconnecting the uh, parity of esteem between youth workers, social workers and teachers across the country. Um, and, it, and it's great to see. Um, the last thing I just wanted to focus on was, well, it's great to have the new duty. It's taken us five years to get that duty over the line. And we've had to take we've had to play a very long game in, in, in nudging and guiding ministers, a bit of legal nudging as well, where's necessary. Um, but we got there in the end and it's making that difference. But we're, 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 we're I guess we're selfish. We're hungry because we're selfish for young people uh, to be to get better and more support going forward. So um, we've we've been working on well, there's an election coming. What does that manifesto need to say? For young people from all the parties um and, and i just wanted to sort of talk you through the briefly the story of this roadmap so um good few years ago government i when i started i uh, started six years ago i met uh, government officials and ministers um as you do going into these jobs and uh what well, was very clear they said to us very quickly there are probably 30 or so organizations um they've all got big voices all shouting at government wanting various different things from us around youth work youth provision support for young people but they're all asking for very different things in different places and it's impossible to know where to start and when there's no money and there was at this point no political will to because youth work had completely dropped off the radar here in england um it's easy for ministers to do very little or nothing um because no it, because there is no coherent voice from the youth sector so we set about as the national body to draw together what we call the national youth sector advisory board so a, a, this is a board which has about four it flexes so sometimes it's 30 sometimes it could go up to 40 50 uh youth organizations from local government from funders from young people from voluntary sector a whole myriad of organizations come together and and we've challenged ourselves over the last few years to come up with our five you know our key asks of government and at the beginning we came up with five key asks we're going into the manifesto uh we've come up with um seven asks of parties and i'm going to run through it very very quickly because i'm pretty sure what i'm talking a bit but the first one is developed you know developing a diverse professional voluntary youth sector workforce and investing in you know great youth work can't happen without great youth workers so there needs to be continued investment in this the second create a clearly defined national youth offer it's great to have the guarantee we I don't know what you know a different Labour government would do or a Lib Dem or a coalition government could do it could be all over the show but um, in England, we, we, we recognise that we're, we're probably one of the only countries in Europe that doesn't have a proper youth strategy, certainly a youth work strategy, and we want that changed. Um, maxing the impact through partnerships, working with our allied sectors and multi-agency working and promoting that. The largest employer of youth workers in England is the NHS. Um, it, you would have thought that was with local authorities. It's not. It's our health services. The second largest employer is our schools, and then it's our councils, then it's the voluntary sector. So... Um, Actually, all these sectors will have to come together and work together and, and be supported to do so. Youth participation, you know, youth work facilitates, develops, empowers young people's voice, putting young people at the heart of everything we do. Um, I love the phrase, not about them without them. And I think we want that, we want that enshrined. The sector needs long term funding and a commitment to the sector. Just to give you an example, we did a review last year talking to 800 youth organisations, grassroots voluntary organisations in particular. The average length of funding here in England for youth work um, is, is nine months. The average pot of funding a project gets is nine months long. It's so some of the th some that's everything from a three year, three month project to a two year grant grant from children in need or somebody um, or the lottery. And it's almost impossible to invest in your team, plan your activities, build what you're trying to do up when you're literally limping month to month. So there has to be a framework that builds a, a more longer term approach to funding for the sector. Um, equity of access of opportunity for all young people. There is a postcode lottery. It can depend where you live. If you've got a third of councils with provision and a third with none, it, there's a real mixed match of what's available. That needs ironing out. That needs to be sorted. And then the last one, building an even stronger workforce evidence base, building on the data. There's loads of work going on with um, lots of stakeholders and partners to 
build up lots of data and evidence and information. We run a national uh, data warehouse, uh, data ecosystem. We have the National Youth Sector Census here, which maps all provision across England now. And all of this intelligence needs to be utilised to strengthen the sector and how it's working. So, yeah, um, we've got the... Um, the roadmap is has been uh, really widely received by the sector. About forty organisations have signed up to it. Everybody who you'd expect, ministers and government have seen it. The opposition have seen it, uh, and uh, we met the, with the opposition just this week to sort of think about what they might want to do going forward. So we hope this provides a roadmap in which to build on the statutory duty shift and to strengthen the sector even further. And I think that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much for that input and. And that and that detail around that there, um, I was particularly struck actually by you know a few things. One, the importance of that kind of positive messaging and the way you put things in terms of money saved, and again that that harks back to what we we're talking about with our MSPs earlier about like investment and that long term investment in, in in youth work. I was also conscious about again that need to have that advisory group which in scotland i'll repeat is is us and and to bring various parties together to to, to have that kind of holistic uh approach and as well like we've we talked a bit earlier um about the going from that kind of strategic framework you know that conceptual framework to making things happen and i, I do think some of the avenues you've been exploring are ways to do that um i was struck um by just one sort of comment we had in the chat from paul little he's talking about the varying capacities of the regional uh, youth work units in england uh, it must be a challenge. Like, how do you find it? What are the differences between like local authorities and different youth work units in engaging uh, with your work? Yeah, it's 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 tricky. I'd be honest. I mean, we, our regional youth work units are great. They do. They really, really do a great job. But they they vary from an organisation with 40 staff to an organisation with a part time volunteer who works a day a week um, and is a volunteer. So. Um, that the, the variance of that as a national body makes that really quite tricky because we want to be able to roll things out universally uh, to each region of the country, you know, get that support on the ground. On the ground. And in some areas, we have to put more energy in ourselves than others. Um, and, I, and I think that's felt on the ground by frontline organisations and providers who in some areas get lots of support uh, and information and insight and, and sharing opportunities. And in others, just it just doesn't exist in the same way. Um, there is some good news. I mean, our, the government, we've, we've, we've finally convinced the government here to put funding in to all the regions so they're now getting two-year funding so they've got the first time they've had core funding for a very long time from the state so um that's enabling them to recruit people and to sort of build up that so that's starting to build that consistency across the nation um we one of the things i'm very proud of is we flow about a third of our income at the nya out to other organizations local training providers and our regional partners so we are investing in them to strengthen what they do locally um and and, and we are we are collective partners there's a role that you need a national regional and a local um you know levels of infrastructure you need local vcs's and the voluntary support at the very local level you need that regional coordination but you also need their national leadership and support and so nya is trying to um you know hold all that together and support those colleagues but um I think it's what I would describe as collective leadership. So it's it's not for NYA to say this is how it's going to be. Uh, it's about us working as partners to build up the the infrastructure in England collectively. Yeah, thank you. And and finally, I don't think I can, I can go away with this necron without sort of touching on on uniformed organisations. And it's really interesting. You know, half, around half a million people involved in scouting in the UK. Thirty five, well, thirty three thousand scouts or in 10,000 adult volunteers in Scotland and you know as you mentioned huge waiting lists too particularly in those those younger age groups but it's just that it, it, it's what I one that was interested to hear you talk about was it, as, as you say like uh, those units they can get smaller as people get older and providing a rich experience is different for a 14 year old than it is to a four year old squirrel scout for example and it does require that investment and it, you know how do we how do we meet that gap where young people get older and start to have a choice and not just a choice of what youth work provision they go to but far more of a choice of what they do with their time in general and those of course could be good things or, or bad things yeah and it's the it's the tug of war between the xbox and the ps playstation and and your youth project your scouts or what have you so um i, I guess that what we're seeing is the older generation so youth work is as popular as ever but but 13 pluses in particular are not so interested in attending a, a more traditional youth club like we might have thought of 
20 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, what young people want is social action projects. They want abilities to be active in their communities. They want the opportunity to volunteer. They, they want uh, purposeful uh, groups that they come together for so more it's not it's, it can be open access and drop in but it's it's having a purpose of coming so i'm not just coming to uh, engage with my friends and, and have a good time because i can do that at home i can do that with my xbox head, headsets on etc um uh, it, it is about creating the spaces in which young people can come and be active in their community uh, and, and and that young people want to give back young people want to be positive members of their community they want to be doing things for the environment they want to be supporting uh, the kind of key issues they see and the injustices and youth work is a political profession right this is what we, we talk about a lot so um you know you, they, that's what young people want to get involved and engaged in it, it doesn't surprise me the i will program continues to do really really well because it is supporting that social action that development um Turning up and going to a, a, a sort of very traditional youth club is becoming less and less appetising. Not, not 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 for everybody, and and for some, they're really interested in that space. But um, actually, there's a challenge on us as practitioners, um, whether we're voluntary or or like me, a professional of twenty odd years, to to rethink about how we provide that support. I think the other area that we're that's that's something we've got to keep a real close eye on is the growth of digital, and you know, young people are living in this generation the ipad generation then you know from the age of two they sort of sit down in front of the telly with an ipad and play games and do stuff so um the use of virtual reality the use of diff digital ways of connecting and keeping young people engaged with we've got a project now which we've been doing and i know you think scotland's been doing some amazing work around digital youth work for a long time with partners um we, we've got a project developing a virtual reality uh youth club space where young people can come and connect and engage and that's one way of meeting that duty for young people who live in the top of a hill in the middle of the Yorkshire Dales who can't get to a youth club because the buses have stopped you know all those things so yeah uh, there's a real challenge on us as practitioners to think about and policymakers and funders to think very differently about the type of provision we support and resource because young people's needs and wants have changed and, are, and we're going to continue to evolve and will evolve faster and faster and faster thank you